Brown. I'll do a couple of good afternoons to get them going. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> oh, no, don't. Don't do that. Hi there. My name is Phil Bailey. And my name is Annie Holmes. And we, uh, uh, but no, no, not yet. We, we, we're just practicing. <laughs> uh, we're the MCs of today's uh, general session and we welcome you uh, to the general session of the fall conference. Uh, we've, each of us has been asked to give a couple minutes of remarks just to get this uh, started. And Annie says that I'm supposed to go first. So as I do this, I'd like to tell you about two members of our Cal Poly community. Fatima, the custodian in my building, faculty offices east, and Maria, the custodian I got to know in the administration building while I was acting provost this summer. <clears throat> Fatima and Maria work largely when we aren't here. And we don't always notice what they do because things are clean when we come in. We notice dirty, but we don't notice clean necessarily. Yet behind the scenes, when we don't see them, they show initiative, dependability, loyalty, and pride. They're proud to be part of the Cal Poly community. They're wonderful role models. I use Fatima and Maria as, as two examples of hundreds in our Cal Poly community. For many years, many of you know that I've been uh, MC of the Service Awards Luncheon. If you've ever attended, you've heard me read excerpts from the colleagues of some of the people we've honored. I wish you could also see the emails, because whether the person is a staff member, a faculty member, a member of the administration, corporation, the stateside, the colleagues that write show enormous respect, pride, admiration for the work and contributions of their colleagues. There are so many people making a difference. So much pride in our Cal Poly community. So many wonderful role models for one another and our students. <clears throat> now, a lot of you know I've been here a long time. And I've seen some very, very good times, some very challenging times. Through all of the times, good or challenging, we've kept our eyes on our values and particularly our students, because we know at Cal Poly, it's all about our students. We've stepped up when we've needed to, and our students have as well. They passed the Cal Poly plan, college-based fees, student success fee. They did their part to make Cal Poly a learn-by-doing polytechnic university. We've always pursued the future. You know, right now we're in the midst of a very robust uh, consideration of a master plan. We've done this before. This isn't the first time. Look at the results of the last campus master plan, for example, and you'll see what can happen when we all come together to do this type of thing. Several engineering buildings, the Construction Innovation Center, Sarah Vista and Poly Canyon Village residence halls, and finally, the Baker Center for Science and Mathematics. <clears throat> for those of you just beginning or early in your career, first, welcome to Cal Poly. You are in a tremendous place. I would ask you, though, at this time, just try to get a mental picture of how things are right now. So a few decades from now, you can compare and see how you and your colleagues helped shape the future of this university. I have that picture when I arrived in 1969 as an excited 26-year-old assistant professor. I knew I'd made the right choice. Here's the comparison. We were California State Polytechnic College with less than 10,000 students. In fact, the catalog at the time 
suggest that there were, in the poultry unit, there were more chickens than we had students at the campus. <laughs> Though we had a state mandate, our reputation was fairly regional. But look at us today. We're a nationally recognized major comprehensive university. Remember, we started well over 100 years ago as a polytechnic high school. I can only imagine what lies ahead. Some of you, this is your first year. Some of you are mid-career. Others may be nearing retirement. It's my 47th year. I really look forward to the coming year with enthusiasm, high hopes, and a belief in the future. Together, we are Cal Poly. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am honored to stand before you today alongside of Cal Poly's most tried, trusted, and truest legacy, Dr. Phil Bailey. His wisdom and guidance are immeasurable. And in my short two and a half years at Cal Poly, I have been impressed by others, students, staff, and faculty who exude the commitment, diligence, and pride that makes Cal Poly stand tall and strong today. What makes this place so great are you, the people. And because of you, we are committed to making Cal Poly greater. To that end, thank you for taking the time to share your experiences in the Campus Climate Survey. We heard you and are working this year to implement change. This year, we will implement the three campus climate priorities that rose from the findings. The first priority is a workplace enhancement strategy so that all faculty and staff feel appreciated and valued for the work you do at Cal Poly. The second priority is to extend the first year experience for new students <clears throat> to a full year. And the third priority is optimizing student services toward becoming a more student-centered institution. In my role, I am also privileged to work with the Inclusive Excellence Council. And this year, we came together to create Cal Poly's first diversity strategic framework. This framework is the infrastructure that will guide the development of unit level and college level diversity plans. The framework and supporting resources are now available on the Office of University Diversity and Inclusivity website. Printed copies of the framework will be distributed at a later date this quarter. This is integral in fostering a diverse and inclusive campus climate because we are an institution that strives to make excellence inclusive. I am excited to get to work this year because I get to continue this work with you. Let's continue to make Cal Poly the best it has ever been. And now we're going to go on with the program, and it's uh, my privilege to introduce our provost. I know what she does is I filled in as acting provost for a couple of months this summer while she was on leave. I didn't do all the things she does. I was impressed at that by looking at what she does and today with her focus, work ethic, and dedication to the university, I'm particularly impressed and happy that she's back. Our provost, Kathleen N. Spinkin. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Phil and Annie. Um, and before I get started, I, I do want to uh, just say thank you to all of you, uh, so many of you who were so kind to me and my family this past spring and summer. And uh, uh, my husband, at a certain point, had to tell me to st stop letting people bring food to our house because he gained about 10 pounds after I got home from the hospital. So um, thank you so much, and thank you especially to Phil for stepping in for me this summer. I came back to a university that was just moving along, doing a, everyone was doing such a great job, and I was afraid that 
uh, President Armstrong was going to tell me I was no longer needed. So, <laughs> uh, a good afternoon again to everyone, and thank you very much for being here. Uh, at this time, I would like to take a moment to recognize all of the new faculty and staff who have joined us just this year. Uh, if this is your first fall conference, and actually some of you it might be your first fall conference even if you've been here a while, um, <laughs> but if you're actually new to the campus, <laughs> yeah, we won't give you away. Uh, please stand up or wave to let people see you and uh, look around and if you see some new people. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here at Cal Poly, for making the commitment to, to come to work with us all. And I hope that the rest of you in the audience will seek out some of these new members of our community at the reception afterwards to introduce yourselves and, and welcome our new colleagues. We all get emails and see the names of various administrators on documents and on programs throughout the year. And we don't always get the opportunity to put names and faces to these individuals. So I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce a number of individuals for you now. Colleagues, uh, as, as I call your name, if you would please stand and face the audience and re remain standing for a moment so that people can see where you are and again put a face to your name. I'll start with our deans and I'm looking across the front row. I think most people are here. Christine Theodoropoulos, the Dean of the College of Architecture and Environmental Design. Dr. Andy Thulin, the Dean of the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environmental Sciences. Dr. Deb Larson, the Dean of the College of Engineering, who is on crutches, so she is. <laughs> Dr. Doug Eberson, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. Of course, Phil Bailey, the Dean of the College of Science and Mathematics. And Dr. Scott Dawson, uh, who I believe is not here yet. He was going to be late. He's, he'll pop in somewhere along the way in a few minutes, I believe. Uh, Scott is the Dean of the Orfala College of Business. I'd also like to introduce, introduce a few others. Dr. Brian Teege, the Vice President for International Graduate, Graduate and Extended Education. <laughs> Dr. Bradford Anderson, the Interim Vice President for Research and Economic Development. <laughs> Bill Britton, our Visiting Head of the Cybersecurity Center and Acting Chief Information Officer. I want to uh, say that again because uh, with the clapping, I'm not sure you heard me, that he is also acting as our chief information officer. Yeah, he gets to stand again. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, for, for stepping in. Um, I'd also like to recognize Dr. Mary Pedersen, the Vice Provost for Academic Programs and Planning, and she's not with us here today, but I wanted to let you know that she sends her warm greetings and her best wishes for a great year. Thank you. Okay. Please also welcome Don Oberhelben, our athletic director. Is Don here? No. He was, uh, he was at his uh, coaches meeting this morning and he said that it was a long agenda and it looks like that was true. Uh, George Hughes, the chief of police for our university police department. I recognize that all of the individuals I've just introduced, with the exception of George, are in the Division of Academic Affairs. And uh, by the way, while I truly love George and respect the work he does as the Chief of Police, I'm very glad that he does not report to me. <laughs> Sorry, George. Um, what I want to say, however, is that while we can't introduce everyone during this event, I want to take a moment to recognize all of the outstanding people who are working across this wonderful university. Our colleagues and partners all across academic affairs, those in ed the uh, administration and finance division, the tremendous professionals in student affairs, the excellent staff in the development area, 
and those working in the President's office. I'm reminded every day of how important it is to have such talented and hardworking people to assist in the task of running this highly complex and exciting enterprise. My thanks to all of you for your investment in Cal Poly. I appreciate it so very much. Finally, I'd like to introduce the members of the President's Cabinet. I am very pleased to introduce the newest member of our Cabinet, Dr. Cindy Villa, our new Vice President for Administration and Finance, who came to us in July. Cindy is joining us from the University of Texas, El Paso, and it's already been a great pleasure to get to know Cindy and to work with her, and I'm very much looking forward to working with her in the future. Okay. Keith Humphrey, our Vice President for Student Affairs. Keith. <laughs> Don Theodora, our General Counsel. <laughs> and finally, Betsy Kinsley, our Chief of Staff, for just two more weeks before we lose her, of all places, to Incline Village in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> Poor Betsy. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy, for all of your hard work. It's been wonderful to work with you these four years. Okay. And last but not least, President Jeffrey Armstrong. <laughs> As I said in my email, which members of the campus received last Friday, there are many great things happening at Cal Poly, and we couldn't be more optimistic about the future. You'll hear a lot more about this, of course, today from President Armstrong. Our budgets are getting better. There are signs of positive support and forward-thinking proposals that are coming out of the Chancellor's office. Our faculty and students continue to be recognized for their outstanding achievements. We are the beneficiaries of significant private philanthropy, and we expect this to be an exciting year to celebrate transformative gifts. But we are optimistic, for the most part, because of your great work. Cal Poly is poised for a transformational decade. And I thank you all again for everything that you do to support this great institution. It's such an honor to recognize today our faculty, our outstanding faculty and staff award winners. And throughout the program, we will feature brief videos for each award, and we will end by inviting our awardees to the stage to receive our hearty congratulations. Thank you again for coming and have a great fall term. And now, let's enjoy the first set of videos. Thank you. Distinguished scholars exemplify the teacher-scholar model by involving students in their research and applying Cal Poly expertise in direct contributions to our home region and state. For over 25 years at Cal Poly, Dr. Brown has conducted research in post-harvest plant physiology, specializing in packaging and food preservation. As just one example, this past June he was awarded a patent for an anti-browning, antimicrobial formula for pre-cut fruits and vegetables. In the last decade, Dr. Brown has been instrumental in bringing over $2 million in research grants to Cal Poly. All the research I've done informs my classes. I mean, I know it's cliche to say that, but it's really, really true. We've done all this work with anti-browning, antifungal, antimicrobial. I can bring that directly when I talk about food safety. I've had undergraduates recently come to me and say, can we work in your lab? Can we work on some of this stuff? This sounds so neat. And so I had, in the spring, I had two undergraduates using that formula with different products and just seeing, does it work, doesn't it work? And they were getting the experience, we're advancing the knowledge, and it was a win-win for both of us. Dr. Costanzo's scholarship lies in the emerging fields of polymers and nanomaterials. His research has been published in prestigious journals such as Polymer Chemistry and has garnered more than $1 million in funding from the National Science Foundation and other sources. As a chemist who has gained a national reputation for scholarship while introducing dozens of students to the rewards of undergraduate research, Dr. Costanzo exemplifies the Cal Poly teacher-scholar model. I really look at scholarship as an extension of teaching. It's just basically one-on-one -on -one teaching and really training them for a very applied position. And so even though it's, it's research, it's really one-on-one -on -one teaching is how I view it. You know, the research I do is it's good, solid research, but what's going to be more lasting is 
my students going on and them doing good research. So if I publish three papers, that's great. But if I train 10 students and they all go publish 10 papers, that's a lot more impact on the scientific community. So that's a, a product that expands more than just the immediate, it's for the future. Dr. Tom Neck's research focuses on the physiological performance of marine organisms in response to climate change. He has published 23 peer-reviewed papers, many of which include his undergraduate and graduate students as co-authors. For his research, Flores has received $2.4 million in grant funding, including almost $1.7 million from the National Science Foundation. So Cal Poly is this wonderful balance between teaching and research. And this means that you involve students, undergraduates, in all aspects of your research and they are discovering these new things. They are doing the cutting edge research and we love to see this. This motivates me. This is the kind of research that then gets funded by the National Science Foundation. We're at the cutting edge and uh, being there is only possible because of the students working so hard and them doing research that is just world class. This year's distinguished teachers are recognized for their excellence in teaching at Cal Poly. They were nominated by their current and former students and selected after extensive in-class evaluations by peer faculty members. Dr. Todd Grenmeyer has been teaching mathematics at Cal Poly since 2003. Using an inquiry-oriented approach to his teaching, Dr. Grenmeyer is passionate about providing his students with opportunities to take ownership of their learning and to develop a deeper understanding of mathematics. We learn mathematics by doing mathematics, not by being passive. Uh, and I explain this clearly to my students on the first day of class every year. I, I tell them, I'm only, some of you, this is going to be very different. You haven't learned mathematics in this way before. Um, but I promise you, I'm doing this because I believe it's best for you. I think most importantly, being a distinguished teacher uh, and being recognized by my students is what means the most to me. So having them take the time to nominate me and recognize me and say nice things about me uh, really means the most. Sandy Stannard has been teaching architecture at Cal Poly since 2001. She is an exceptional and passionate teacher known for setting high standards for her students and helping them achieve their best work. My honor of, of getting a teaching award comes from having such fantastic students. So they come with their own intellect and their own energy and then combine that with my own passion for what I'm doing and that makes for a really rich, you know, kind of exchange, intellectual exchange. You know, teaching is a continuous art that I, you know, we're always working on, at least I am, trying to refine and reflect and listen to feedback and become better and so to be recognized for teaching and something that you're passionate about is incredibly special. Dr. Dustin Stegner has been teaching in the English department at Cal Poly since 2007. He utilizes his passion for literature and his great sense of humor to engage his students and have them achieve far beyond their expectations. I think what I'd like my students to think about Cal Poly is that it's not the end, but really the beginning of all the learning that they're going to do. And what I would like them to take away, at least in my teaching, is you've read you know, a few dozen texts and a few dozen books and plays, but now you can read any play or book that you want. And it's like we really stress in the department and in the college that we don't just give you knowledge, of course we do that too, but we teach you how to think and how to write, and that's going to serve the students whatever career, whatever path they take. It is fun and inspiring to watch these videos. It is my pleasure to introduce three speakers who will offer greetings on behalf of their constituencies. First will be Glenn Thorncroft, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, who is representing the Labor Council at this year's fall conference. Next will be Owen Schwagerly, our ASI president for this academic year. Congratulations, Owen. Owen is a fourth year in the College of 
agriculture, food, and environmental science, and is studying agricultural business. And third will be Gary Laver. As chair of our academic senate, he is a professor of psychology and child development in the College of Liberal Arts and came to Cal Poly in 1991. This is Professor Laver's 18th year with the academic senate and his second year serving as its chair. Professor Thorncroft, the podium is yours. <laughs> I see a lot of red. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm also past president of the California Faculty Association. That's the, for those of you who are new here, that's the uh, union that uh, negotiates the uh, contracts for all of the CSU, including the coaches, counselors, and librarians. I don't think you can understate how important last year was for us here at Cal Poly. Who knew we'd be a, become a faculty of activists? Uh, you have rediscovered your rightful voice, and we need that voice to ensure shared governance and transparency and to have spirited debate on countless, countless other decisions that affect our campus, as well as our colleagues and our students, of course. And that voice works. President Armstrong increased the faculty uh, equity pay program, not once, but twice last year, and it now includes lecturers, coaches, and librarians. Make no mistake, you did this. The listening sessions were a turning point. I, I was on leave last year, but I watched them. Uh, and the rally we held at the administration building in May, well, you inspired me to show up for that. Uh, it was the largest faculty rally at Cal Poly ever, and the largest rally on this particular issue in the entire CSU. You have become a force to reckon with on this campus and a political leader across the CSU. Us, Cal Poly. That's why we're wearing red today. It's, it says that we stand together, and I like to also say that it means that you ain't seen nothing yet. Which brings me to the contract. CFA is negotiating year two of our contract. Salary is the only thing on the table. We've asked for a 5% salary increase for everyone, plus one service step increase, otherwise known as an SSI. And, and if you don't know what an SSI is, it doesn't matter because even though it's in the contract and been there for years, uh, the chancellor's not gonna fund it. Um, in fact, he honestly doesn't think that you need any more than a 2% raise. I, I don't know if he knows um, I, or chooses not to know. That's especially demoralizing since the CSU just got a $97 million increase in its budget. But in his defense, the chancellor has announced that he wants to lift the pay freeze for campus presidents so that he can, I'm not laughing, that's not funny so that he can offer them higher salaries. It's kind of funny. I hear that Chancellor White is planning to visit each campus very soon, and when he comes here, I'm expecting one hell of a listening session. And President Armstrong, I know we're together on this one. You've repeatedly said that our salaries aren't high enough. We'll be expecting you to stand with us in that room. and wearing red. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Owen Schwagerly. Sorry, are we good? <laughs> okay. My name's Owen, and I'm happy and very excited to be here with you all today and welcome you back to the start of another school year. If you've been across campus today, you see there's students out there, they are back, we have wowies on campus, and the energy is there. It's the start of a new beginning for a lot of these students, and hopefully we can help inspire them to get grounded at our school and get involved on our campus. And San Luis Obispo 
is a very special place. It's a hidden gem. We are very blessed and privileged to live here and go to school here. And our education that we receive here is top of the line because of our faculty and staff and our learn by doing. In South Korea, they call their teachers nation builders. In that culture, they respect everyone who's involved in the line of teaching and, and in that profession. And at Cal Poly, we respect our staff, faculty and staff. If you ever spend time with students in a classroom or in office hours with them, you are a nation builder. You are training the future engineers, bankers, policymakers, and school teachers. The work that you do matters. You are making differences in all of these students' lives. For example, when I was a freshman, I came in and my first quarter, I was struggling in pre-calculus. I nearly failed the class, but my professor, she was so encouraging. She took me in, she really just told me that I could do it. She never told me I had a stupid question. And she inspired me to finish and I passed that pre-calculus class. And so I firmly believe that the faculty and staff at our school are committed to our students. They don't give up on our students. And it's your hard work that leads to the student's success. And that is a reflection of everything that you do. A goal I have this year is about increasing our school spirit and our pride. And I want everyone to know on our campus that no matter who you are or where you're from or what your background is, we are all Mustangs. We are part of the Mustang family and the Mustang way unites us. And so this year, it is my hope that we have a strong sense of community and belonging on our campus. And in ending, I want to encourage you all that you have positions of great influence. Remember why you do what you do. If you have never been thanked before, I want to thank you on behalf of all 20,000 students here at Cal Poly for all of your hard work and dedication and commitment to the students here. You have made a difference in all our lives, and we are so appreciative. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Gary Laver. I'm the chair of the Academic Senate. To everyone here today, those new to campus and those returning, welcome. The academic year is new for all of us, and I hope it'll be a productive one. Despite our various campus responsibilities, uh, our gathering this way at the beginning of the year underscores our common purpose. It's fairly safe to say that we're all here at Cal Poly to serve the students. Clearly, we all do what we do on their behalf. But the we I refer to is just as clearly a blend of different constituencies. And while we may hold the common goal of our students' growth and welfare, it would be a great oversimplification to ignore the reality that our various roles on campus often give us differing immediate priorities. Our different daily concerns do not fully overlap, nor should they be expected to. Among the many elements that make a university strong, we might include its commitment to students and to rigorous intellectual pursuit, naturally its ability to adapt in the face of constant change, its financial security, and the support of its personnel, without whom none of the above would be possible. Our jobs are complex, and somehow they seem to become more so with every passing year. But depending on our particular role on campus, it is only natural that as individuals, we see some challenges as more pressing than others. And we may also wonder why some colleagues do not share our prioritization of those challenges or our sense of how best to address them. There is no doubt in my mind that the diversity of our opinions about the operation and goals of Cal Poly, when shared in a responsible, straightforward manner, is directly correlated to Cal Poly's strength and success. Given that we are all here in the service of our students, I feel that uh, promoting not only the vitality, but the integrity of that conversation as well 
is a basic responsibility of everyone in this room. As partners in the delivery of higher education, the various groups gathered in this room today, all of us, share more common ground than we often realize. To my encouragement, in an era just past when economic pressures seemed to justify lowered expectations and mediocrity, what I heard at Cal Poly's collect what I heard at Cal Poly was a collective voice saying, no, that direction is not for us. Of course, being heard is critical, and the role of the Academic Senate is to make sure the concerns of the faculty are always part of the ongoing campus conversation. The Academic Senate will continue its work to ensure the concerns of the faculty are heard, and I look forward to another year of working with you all on behalf of our students. Thank you for your attention. The Outstanding Staff Award recognizes an individual's dedication, loyalty, expertise, and contributions to Cal Poly. Donetta began work at Cal Poly in 1979. She is regarded as a role model for everyone in the department, to both faculty and students. Donetta coordinates a wide array of events each year for various groups visiting campus, and in all cases, these events run seamlessly and present an excellent public face for Cal Poly. I thoroughly do enjoy coming to work every day and to work with the students. Many of them call me their Cal Poly mom and that just warms my heart. I'm very thankful, humbled and honored to receive this award. My faculty are like family to me and they put the, the award nomination together as a group. And in fact, when it was revealed that I won the award, it was at one of our banquets. And honestly, they were possibly more excited than I was even to see me receive this award. Um, we are a family and I just feel like they always have my back. And this is just one example. In his role as project and event manager, Don has earned high praise for providing the best possible service in support of all campus-wide events. A coworker said of Don, he has thoughtful ideas, excellent listening skills, and always finds a way to bolster you up when you need it the most. What motivates me to, to do an excellent job for the events, I think primarily would be my father. He has, as long as I've ever known him, to be a uh, hard worker and a great eye for detail. And to see these students with their parents, it just, it's one of those things that pushes me to make sure that these students and, and the parents have that experience that I shared. Maria has been at Cal Poly for 28 years and is highly respected and well-liked for her advocacy of and commitment to the students she serves. She is especially dedicated to serving low-income, underrepresented, and first-generation students. I love Cal Poly. I believe in this institution. Um, my experience in higher education changed my life in a profound way. I've always believed that if you do good work, it's going to show for itself. But this, this award has been an incredible honor. I just want to say kudos to Cal Poly, to all our community, and say that our collaboration, our continued efforts will just, you know, be able to produce fruits for, for many more years. So I'm happy to be a part of, of the Cal Poly community. The Outstanding Faculty Advisor Award recognizes a faculty member who has had a positive influence on students through academic advising. This year's recipient of the award is Kristen Cardinal. Dr. Cardinal's ability to build real-world skills for engineering students through research opportunities and industrial collaboration fosters self-confidence, and her advising and support has a major impact on student success. I think what motivates me most of all is that I really like the students, that I really care about them. They're good people, they're fun to work with, they're bright, they're, they're motivated. I think motivation is contagious, so if they really want something, um, it makes me really want to help them do that. Um, and then I think also the fact that I had such uh, strong and impactful advisors myself 
uh, that I know I benefited from uh, really motivates me to help do what I can uh, in that capacity when I have the opportunity to help students. Hi again. I have been really fortunate in my 47, 46 years at Cal Poly to serve under three wonderful presidents. President Robert Kennedy, for whom Kennedy Library is named, President Warren Baker, honored with the Baker Center, and now Jeff Armstrong. Jeff has lived Cal Poly from day one. He supports the university in so many ways with his energy, time, and even personal resources. He truly cares about the Cal Poly community and each individual. He texts a lot, too. I get lots of texts. I bet I get more than you do, Sharon. <laughs> and he also has extremely good taste in ties. It's my pleasure to welcome President Jeff Armstrong. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, I joined Kathleen in thanking you for your uh, service last uh, spring. I'm glad you're not doing it anymore. I'm glad Kathleen's here, so glad Kathleen's back. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. Especially welcome to our, our new folks. For some of you, it is welcome back. And for many of you, we want to thank you for all the hard work during the summer. You spend the time when most of the students are away, making the classrooms beautiful and clean, keeping the paperwork in order, and making sure everything is ready for the wowies and later for classes. We appreciate that. To all our faculty and staff, I want to say thank you for all you do for Cal Poly. And I want to add a phrase that I've used many times this weekend to parents and supporters, especially our new students. And it pertains to you whether you've been here 47 years or four days or four minutes. Thank you for choosing Cal Poly. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. And for those of you that are new, when you hear wowie, that means this is week of welcome. And the freshmen are called wowies. And also our transfer students, they're called wowies. It is amazing out there when you see and meet all these amazing first year and transfer students that are on campus this week. You should know that they are of the highest quality class in Cal Poly's history. The highest ever entering GPA and ACT, SAT profile in our history. They are the most diverse class ever, social, economic, and geodemographic. And for the first time ever, our entering class is 50% women. This wouldn't happen without you. Congratulations. You see, you make Cal Poly great, and that shows in this bright group of freshmen and transfers. I join my other speakers. I am very excited about the future. I have to say to all of us again, congratulations. We're on a roll, 23 years in a row. The streak is still alive as the best public master's university in the West. And I always point out to people, they only do it by region, or we would certainly be the best public in the United States. But again, what another remarkable testament to your focus on student success. Focus on student success that results in all of our colleges individually increasing in their rankings. And I'll get in trouble, and I'm not going to mention them all, but let me mention a few. Our architecture program is number two in the nation, depending on the year, number one. In the most recent US News and World Report rankings, our engineering programs were rated the seventh best overall and the number one state-funded 
BS and master's program in the United States. That's worthy of an applause. We also earned a few new accolades this year. For the first time, the Orfila College of Business made it on the list for the best undergraduate business programs, according to US News and World Report. They've been rising in many other rankings, as many of our other programs in the colleges have been doing. Like many other programs on, on campus, they boast a nearly 100% hiring rate for some programs. In this case, I'll give you an example, accounting, at the time of graduation. Keith Humphrey and his folks tell me that six to nine months out across our university, our placement rate is well over 90%. And I'm also very pleased, and it was very appropriate, 9-11, our soccer team played uh, Air Force just this past Friday, that for the first time, Cal Poly was ranked 10th best veteran friendly among all the Western universities. So thank you for all of this work. But before I leave these rankings, let me mention one other, one other point. It's good to be the best public master's university in the West, but let's not be satisfied with that. We can be the best. What does that mean? That means moving from 10th to 1st of all the universities of our class in the Western United States, 15 states. And it's not just about rankings, because if you peel apart what they use, they're all measures where we want to improve because it results, to stu results in student success, and it's right in our wheelhouse. I believe we can do this, and I believe we can do it in five years. I'm confident because of you today, you in this hall, and Owen, all of those students that you represent. Now, before I get into the heart of my remarks, I want to also recognize a few people today. And first, I want to recognize my uh, good friend in, in fundraising, and I do text her quite often. Uh, Sharon, would you please stand? And, and some other people that have already been recognized and some that have not. But I also want to say thank you, Cindy Villa, for choosing Cal Poly. Thanks for coming here after a wonderful career at UTEP, and you're already making a difference. And then to Betsy, I know our community leaders, as well as many on campus, uh, share with us in our loss uh, uh, that we feel very badly that you're leaving, but we feel very good for you and your family. Uh, so to Kai, Cora, and Cole, and Betsy, best of wishes. We're going to miss you. And Cal Poly is part of this wonderful community that Owen spoke of earlier. Uh, pleased to introduce a few dignitaries that are here today, and hopefully I won't miss anyone. Uh, but from our city, the mayor, uh, Jan Marks is here, San Luis Obispo mayor. Thank you, mayor. And our vice mayor and council member, John Ashball, here. And from our county board of supervisors, uh, Adam Hill. And representing the San Luis Coastal Unified School District uh, is Anthony Palazzo. Thank you, Anthony. And then, of course, we have the president of Cuesta, uh, president and superintendent of Cuesta Community College, a Cal Poly alum and soon-to-be award winner, Gil Stork. You'll have to come to the alumni award banquet to get the rest of that story. Well, here's what I'm not going to talk about today. I'm not going to give you long updates with facts and figures. You didn't pick up a lot of handouts coming in the door. No PowerPoint slides, no death by PowerPoint, no spreadsheets, but that doesn't mean you don't have some homework. On Friday, you received a comprehensive update on some really important issues from Kathleen, Keith, and Cindy. So homework number one, right off the bat, read that if you haven't already done so. What I, wanted, what I want to talk about today is progress that we're making, as well as how do we make additional progress toward our Vision 2022 goals. Three main topics. 
faculty and staff success, and welcome back, Glenn. That's supposed to elicit a applause. <laughs> and I'm serious. Faculty and staff success, very serious topic. Student success, which is dependent on the former, and money. Money. The short answer is that we can't accomplish everything that we want to accomplish with state funds alone. We must develop a stream of Cal Poly unique funds in order to move forward. I'm then going to talk about what it will take to accomplish these goals as we deal with classes. Think about them as prerequisites to success. We cannot have true success without enhanced diversity, a better campus climate, and di discipline and focus regarding our fundamental commitments. So let's dive right in. Faculty and staff success. All the speakers, provost, Phil, Annie, everyone set me up for this one. You need competitive compensation benefiting the excellence and the geographic location of, of Cal Poly. Let me repeat that. You need competitive compensation and salaries are a key part of that befitting the excellence in the geographic location of Cal Poly. We also need to increase our tenure track density. We need to hire more faculty and staff. This is, this is going to take a tremendous, a tremendous balancing act, and it also emphasizes the need for additional streams of revenue. We're making a start, but this will take additional funds and time. As the update from my colleagues said, it's a big deal that we've actually been able to do something beyond the bargain salaries. If you look at our mandatory costs, energy, new space, uh, bargain benefits, a lot of funds that are dedicated for distinct purposes, all of our student funds, none of those can be used for uh, salary increases. If you add all that together, we only have a bit of the pie left that is discretionary that we can really work with. Let me provide just a few details now, and I'll come back to the budget, but the real details are in the update. In this last round of bargaining agreements, each campus had to come up with money for one-third of the bargain 3% increase from last year. This is not a typical move, but the system was determined to stretch and provide that 3%. That was the previous year's budget. That meant $1.1 million for Cal Poly. That's money we couldn't spend on other priorities, but it was a worthy investment. It was a top priority. So when we commit three and hopefully three and a half million in this four phase plan, when we commit that above and beyond bargain salaries, it's a big deal for Cal Poly's budget. It's something we need to do, but we need to understand it means we're spending fewer dollars on class availability, scholarships, deferred maintenance, and other priorities. As I said before, at the same time, we know it's not enough. As I stated earlier, our long-term goal is competitive salaries befitting the excellence and the geographic location of Cal Poly. Next, let me turn to student success. When we talk about student success, we most often think about hiring more faculty and adding additional classes. However, at Cal Poly, we also must focus on housing. We do not have enough beds for our second year students on this campus. We can only house 60% of our sophomores. Consequently, we're missing a big opportunity for impact on student success. Construction is about to start on our Housing South project. This is gonna open up 1,450 beds for freshmen, which really is going to open up about 1,100 or more beds for sophomores to live on campus. Why does this matter? Big difference in retention and progress toward degree for the students who live on campus only one year versus two years. Housing more students on campus will result in a 10% or even maybe a 15% increase 
depending on the student, the major, and the demographics, just by living on campus. And in the longer term, through our campus master planning, we, would add, we, we are planning to add housing for faculty and staff that is more affordable. Our future housing projects, whether it's student, faculty, and staff, are not going to be driven through traditional funds, but they're going to be driven through public-private partnerships, which also provide an avenue for revenue, discretionary revenue. Speaking of revenue, third topic, money. We don't have enough of it. I could sit down now, right? Again, I'm going to refer you to the comprehensive update. There is a lot of information there. We talk about new revenue that you'll see in the future and how we've spent our money since 2011. The short story is that we're finally coming out of a tailspin. And those of you that have been here, you know that that tailspin was seven years, no salary adjustments other than a 10% give back. We know that challenges remain, but we're optimistic for the future. Why are we optimistic? Well, one, the economy is turning around, and the CSU budget request was, was funded, fully funded for the first time in a very long time. But that doesn't mean we're back where we should be. We're still $36 million behind in state support to Cal Poly from the peak budget year of 2007, 2008. $36 million behind since 2007 and 2008. But what it does mean is with more certainty, we can actually begin to stabilize and predict our budget enough to plan for the future and make some investments. And this means making those investments and making slow and steady progress in addressing our priorities. Second reason for optimism. There are game-changing recommendations and proposals coming out of the Chancellor's Office. Last week's update mentioned the draft report released by the task force for a sustainable financial model for the CSU, a task force that met repeatedly. And Kathleen served on this task force. Thank you, Kathleen. The task, the task force proposes that the CSU consider alternative measures for allocating state funds such as performance and outcome-based funding instead of the current model which basically allocates an amount to each campus simply based on the number of students served and thus places a disproportionate emphasis on growth. Importantly for Cal Poly, the task force also recommends that individual campuses have the authority to propose market-based tuition for non-resident, non-California, and international students. This recommended change would be huge for Cal Poly, game-changing revenue. Our Cal Poly-focused student fees and non-resident enrollment growth over the past few years are examples of game-changing revenue. As Phil said it earlier, the Cal Poly plan the college-based fees, student success fee, growth in out-of-state resident students. And I want to introduce our chair of our student board, uh, Vito Monteverdi. Vito, right here. Would you please stand? I wanted a good opportunity to introduce Vito, so not only is he chair of the, the board, but he's an out-of-state student. How many in the room are Cal Poly grads? Okay, if you're 2008 or earlier, the state was the vast majority supporter and what you paid is way lower than what's being paid now because today, students, parents, and supporters are the majority funders of Cal Poly's budget. That's to the tune of about 60% of our budget is coming from our students uh, their parents and supporters. Don't get me wrong, this state support is extremely significant and we would love for the state to continue to invest in the CSU, but we cannot rely on state funding to achieve what I know we can achieve. We cannot, allow, we cannot 
simply rely on state funding to continue to drive us uh, toward excellence year after year. And we absolutely cannot keep going back to our California students and their families asking for more every time we have a challenge. You know, it is remarkable to think about what you've accomplished and what our students have accomplished over this past decade, in particularly considering the hand that you, that we were dealt. You did it as you worked as partners to identify needs, protect core mission, and invest. Our students have been tremendous in stepping up. Thank you, students. But while we cannot and will not dilute our focus on student success, learn by, learn by doing, and our drive for continued excellence, we must diversify our funding sources. Faculty and staff success, student success, housing, diversity and inclusivity, deferred maintenance, new classrooms, labs, offices, doing this right takes investment more money than we can expect to receive from the state, even under some of the most rosy scenarios. I am more confident than ever that we will find that money from market-based or market-rate non-resident, non-California tuition, from, from public-private partnerships, from private gifts, the likes of which Cal Poly have never experienced. I also believe that because more and more industry and entrepreneurial partners want and need what we provide, a comprehensive polytechnic learn by doing education, and they need these students so much, they will be willing to put more and more skin in the game and partner with us, helping the bottom line, helping our bottom line, and giving our students learn by doing opportunities within the confines of our mission and vision and our values. Following up money, we should talk about fundraising. As you know, and we've said many, many times, philanthropy has been exciting for Cal Poly uh, this past year. We raised nearly $72 million. That's the second largest in the history of Cal Poly. Those private gifts support programs, services, and capital projects in all six colleges, student affairs, athletics, arts, and more. These gifts would not be possible without professional fundraisers working, working side by side with our faculty, deans, advisors, athletic director, coaches, and many others. Their role and their expertise is essentially matchmaking. They match your college, your department, your unit's interest with a commitment from a donor a passion from a donor, whether they attended Cal Poly or not, they're passionate about what we're doing. As a result of the investments by our foundation and a $2.1 million investment that we made a few years ago, we're getting better and better at this whole world of philanthropy. Now, there's one more thing before I move on. And I have to say, and many of you that have been around me know, I love data and I love spreadsheets. You can ask any member of our leadership team, our new campus advisory council, students, they will verify this point for you. So I promised I wasn't going to show you a spreadsheet, but I didn't say I wouldn't talk about one. So I got to do that for a moment. In the budget section of this update, there's a link to our administration and finance page where there's already everything you ever want to know about our budget. But it, it's, it's a lot of information. So what we've done is we built a, a spreadsheet. It's called Five-Year Base Budget Summary. To me, it tells a very clear story of how we've spent our money since 2011, the year I started. So let me give you just an overarching summary. Over 85% of the revenue that we've received since 2011. Now, I'm referring to revenue because the first year I was here, we received a $35 million cut from the state. 
that was offset by about 20, a little over 20 million increase in student fees at the system tuition level. But 85% of that revenue that came in has been used for mandatory costs such as energy, benefits for employees, new space, some uh, CSU costs, pass-through funds such as student health fees, and then we have directed funds that go straight to the college, college-based fee, and then our student success fee, which is determined by a committee that is majority made up of students. So I won't go into those details more, but it's, it's on that website, take a look. But I know everybody doesn't love spreadsheets like I do. Is Victor, are you here? Victor Brancart? Oh, there he is, good. Oh, oh stand up, Victor, this is the best part. He, <laughs> he has no idea this is coming. I want to make sure you all know a, a very important person. Victor Brancart is, is not new to Cal Poly, but since Karen Webb re retired, uh, Cindy has asked him to serve as our interim associate vice president for administration and finance. So look at that spreadsheet. If you have any questions, email and call Victor. So I provided a series of goals earlier, and I said there were prerequisites to achieving these goals. And I know we're one Cal Poly behind those goals. But we cannot have faculty and staff success, and thus we cannot have student success, if we don't make Cal Poly more reflective of the state that we serve. And it isn't one before the other. Students want to see Students want to see a diverse faculty and staff who represent their cultures and backgrounds, and our faculty and staff want to see students the same way. Moreover, employers are increasingly asking for a more diverse workforce. This is directly related to campus climate, recruitment, retention, and academic success. A sense of belonging for everyone at Cal Poly. Jim Maravilla and his team, working with our deans, have done an amazing job increasing diversity of our student body through our partner high school program, and more recently in selected colleges through Cal Poly Scholars. We know how to move forward in many of these ways, in, in, in making our campus more diverse, our students more diverse. We have to continue to grow these programs with private support and new revenue. We're accelerating our efforts to partner with businesses that hire our students, with alumni and other funders, in order to provide more scholarships and advising and other support services for underrepresented minority students and women. As I mentioned earlier, the bottom line is we know how to do it. We can make significant progress, diversity and campus climate, but it requires additional investments. Annie. Phil, thanks for emceeing, and Annie, thanks for your comments. She mentioned some of the initiatives that will get underway this fall to address campus climate and diversity. As the president of this university, I can tell you that it's my goal and it's my expectation that every single member of the Cal Poly family make a personal commitment to improving campus climate some way, somehow. Moreover, it is my goal, uh, it is my expectation and goal as well that every single member of the Cal Poly family make a personal commitment to help us become a more diverse campus and a welcoming campus for all. There's, there's more coming, there'll be more organized things to think about, but think about it in the following. Support your colleagues. Say thank you. Just say hello. Just say hi. Or nice job. Or simply stop. Be in the moment and listen. I think we all know how many times a conversation would have been better if we had said less and listened more. Every person on this campus matters. 
every person on this campus matters, and every person on this campus deserves your respect. So every person on this campus matters, and every person on this campus deserves your respect, even if you don't always agree with them. We're all on the same team, working toward the same goal, one Cal Poly. Now, an equally important goal for myself, our leadership team, and thus campus is to enhance our discipline and focus on our fundamental commitments. You've seen changes in our master plan and delays in considering new initiatives. Focus on staff, faculty, and student success and our other goals will be enhanced through shared governance involving the Academic Senate and ASI. Equally, equally important, we have listened and considered our partners off campus, city and county government, Cuesta and Hancock Community College, K through 12, our neighbors, business leaders, alumni, and others. Earlier this summer, the CSU trustees and presidents met with the chancellor and his leadership team and considered a question. What are our fundamental commitments? That's a good question. And by the way, as Glenn mentioned, the chancellor will be visiting Cal Poly in early November as part of his plan to visit every campus this academic year. He wants to talk with us about that question. What's great is the CSU fundamental commitments, what the chancellor's calling touchstones, align perfectly with ours. Here are the CSU touchstones. Student learning and success, faculty and staff success, quality of the educational experience, advancing economic development and quality of life of the communities that we serve, diversity and inclusivity. Fundamental commitments. This also applies to our budget and how we spend our limited discretionary funds. Another absolutely critical tool to make sure that every decision we make supports our fundamental decisions, our fundamental commitments, is our campus master plan. Completing the update to our plan is enormously important as it's our guide for the next 20 years this master plan must support our ability to deliver on our fundamental commitments and priorities well into the future. We have to look around the corner with this master plan. It's been an amazing process so far with hundreds, no, thousands of people that have participated from the campus, the community, alumni, advisory boards, people participating in committees workshops, and just otherwise weighing in on this important uh, plan that we're developing. Some of the ideas from the start were controversial, but from the beginning we were intentional in taking a transparent approach, placing all ideas on the table so everyone could see them and comment on those ideas. Sometimes the answer is that it's time to do something new and make strategic and sometimes difficult decisions. And sometimes the answer is that there was a good reason for things being the way that they are, and they should stay that way, like preserving prime ag land that is close to our campus core and leaving our arboretum where it is. <laughs> Let me also remind you of a key principle of our planning not just our planning, but of our implementation, is that when we, we will not remove a building and associated function until it is replaced. So if you think about the arrow hanger or greenhouses or other activity or facilities that are housing activities, keep that in mind. That is a principle and that is a firm commitment on our part. A key part of Vision 2022 is enhancing Cal Poly as a residential campus. This means we're moving more and more toward having 24-7 services across campus and thus adding retail and other services beyond housing. I ran into some faculty and staff 
I'm sure they're here today in the back of the line and they said, we need more Starbucks. The line was halfway down the union. I feel your pain. Retail and ha housing projects though, in the future are gonna be public-private partnerships. Such partnerships would be negotiated as to provide great service and additional revenue to the campus. And this has been demonstrated across California, Canada, and the nation. So where are we with the master plan? During the summer, the professional team reviewed all of the input from the master plan advisory committees and comments received in the spring from campus and the community. They also conducted additional analysis of how to fit academic facilities and student housing onto Cal Poly's land, a jigsaw puzzle. The team has initial concepts for you today, more and more about the campus core, and they're exciting. Key point, more homework. Your continued engagement is critical. It is not over. We're gonna take full advantage of you being here today. Please take the time today, after you go out and get a beverage, to come back into the lobby and view the maps. Our team's out there working to put them up now, and you can look at them and take a look, send in comments a lot of different ways. One way is through our master planning website. It is masterplan.calpoly.edu. You can also comment at sessions we're gonna have in October. More details will follow, but for now, it's critical to note that we want the big pieces in place by the end of the fall quarter so we can, our professionals can start writing the environmental impact report. And then our goal is to have it approved by the Board of Trustees in the spring of 2017. So end of fall quarter, we wanna have the big pieces of the puzzle in place on the map. So the last thing I wanna talk with you today about is enrollment. Cal Poly has been steadily growing and we've successfully met and in most years, we have gone slightly over the targets for California students given to us by the CSU. We've also increased our non-resident enrollment, which I'll say again, has helped keep us out of dire straits when it comes to budget. When I talk about non-resident enrollment, it's important to note that in the political discussions of resident versus non-resident uh, students in the CSU, there's a common misperception that non-resident students students take away seats from resident students. Misconception that non-resident students take away seats from resident students. It is simply not true. In fact, I believe it is fair to say that without the growth of non-resident students, we would not be serving the same number of California students at this university today, and we would not be talking about three to three and a half million dollars in a salary equity program. From the CSU perspective, they give us specific dollar amount for a specific number of California residents that they tell us we should enroll and we have to hit that target. So we have to meet that target for California residents regardless of the number of non-resident students. You've heard me say in the past at one of these meetings, not too long ago, that Cal Poly could grow to 25,000 students. And matter of fact, that's the number that our master planning process, our academic planning, and all of that's led has confirmed that number as 25,000. So the really big question is how do we do that while fulfilling our fundamental commitments? Faculty and staff success, student success, diversity, campus climate, etc. How can Cal Poly grow and still make sure our students have access to classes in well-functioning buildings and in too often cases, not so well-functioning buildings? How can Cal Poly grow and invest more in competitive salaries, hiring more faculty and staff and other key priorities? How can Cal Poly continue to grow while maintaining academic excellence and quality of a Cal Poly comprehensive polytechnic learn by doing education? The answer is in the short term, we can't. 
We can't. We have to hit the pause button or significantly limit growth in the future. I don't have to tell you, you are people on the front line teaching and caring for our students, whether it's directly with them or behind the scenes. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, we've hit boundaries in a lot of places. We've hit boundaries for housing our first year students. We've hit a boundary in classroom space, project, play, project space, labs, and faculty offices. In fact, we have temporary faculty offices. And speaking of those offices, we need more faculty now with the student population that we have to enhance the teacher scholar model, to enhance learn by doing, to, build, to build undergraduate research that's driven by faculty and students together. We've hit a boundary in some of our infrastructure and facilities, uh, deferred maintenance and support services. So it's time to hit the pause button to allow us to catch up and to develop some of those key funding sources. And we also need time to move some of our critical capital projects uh, to fruition so we can have more space for uh, more and better spacing, spaces for teaching, learning, and research. We have some really good ideas online and we believe we will have some quality undergraduate teaching and learning space online by 2021, 2020 at the, at the earliest and that it will hopefully we can find a way to include some classrooms. But we need time to plan and prepare. We need to focus on our fundamental commitments. So what I plan to do is approach Chancellor Tim White and Vice Chancellor Lauren Blanchard with a plan for Cal Poly to maintain what we're calling a steady state enrollment. What this means is essentially capping or significantly uh, restricting enrollment growth for a period of time until we can make fundamental changes in these barriers or factors of, that are limiting growth. But before I close, let me be clear on a very important point. This is a temporary plan and it is very difficult. As I spent this past weekend meeting numerous parents, supporters, and students, it was just an a, a ongoing reminder of the tremendous quality of this university and the huge demand that students, of these students that are tremendous that want to come to Cal Poly. It's clear that our reputation is, is excellent and it's growing. It's growing not just through the rankings, but by the clear demand for admission into Cal Poly. Equally important, I found as soon as I got here, and it's been reiterated every time I meet employers, alumni, is the demand for Cal Poly graduates. We have different sectors that are demanding a doubling of the number of graduates. They want more Cal Poly graduates. California and the U.S. need more Cal Poly graduates. So we cannot drop our long-term view that we need to grow and provide more graduates for California. And this also includes, not this year, but in the future, discussing year-round operations so we can be more efficient with the facilities that we have. Well, let me end by saying how, how much I thank, I, I thank you and I appreciate all that you do. It's remarkable what you've been able to do and what you've been able to accomplish over the past decade, considering all the circumstances and your hard work and dedication is amazing. The quality that you bring to the classroom, to whatever your role is here at Cal Poly, direct or indirect influencer of student success uh, is awesome. It is astonishing. And for many of you that have been here a long time and some that even graduated, it is such, we're such a pillar, we're such a high quality compared to so many other parts of the, of the world and what you deliver to our students. Think about where we can go next. Again, working together, one Cal Poly. Faculty and staff success, student success, 
a Cal Poly that better reflects California, a Cal Poly that is supportive and welcoming to all, we can accomplish this through shared governance, shared vision, mutual respect, and shared commitment to our fundamental priorities and commitments. And it's really embodied in what the students started in the Mustang way, pride, character, and responsibility. So your last homework, it's everybody's responsibility, not just Cal Poly, but in this community to work together. So thank you, have a great year, thanks for your patience, and let's turn to another set of videos. Congratulations to all the honorees. Thank you and go Mustangs. The Learn by Doing Scholar Award is a brand new faculty award. It was created to recognize outstanding faculty scholarship about Learn by Doing, Cal Poly's signature pedagogy. In the planned and in progress research category, Dr. Poiker was recognized for his work with a colleague that included implementing a freshman service project. In this project, freshman engineering student teams designed an outreach experience where they share the excitement of becoming an engineer with children in area elementary and middle schools. I basically was thinking how can I incorporate Learn by Doing into a freshman seminar with 180 plus students in one, one lecture hall and that's basically what I'm focusing on right now. How can I bring a interactive student-centered pedagogy to, to those students in that freshman seminar? Um, we really perceive that our approach might be a template which could be applied nationwide to freshman uh, engineering seminar type courses and this is really exciting and I think the award will, will help us to even further promote um, our approach. Dr. Taylor was recognized in the published research category of this award for his research on activity for all. This was a capstone experience that brings students together across college and department lines to design equipment that helps people with disabilities participate in active sports. So we engaged with faculty and students in the College of Engineering to design and build prototype unique equipment that would enable individuals to participate more fully in physical activity. And both the Kines students and the engineering students benefited profoundly from working in those multidisciplinary environments. Being recognized for Learn by Doing at an institution that prides itself on Learn by Doing is a high honor. I couldn't do Learn by Doing without my colleagues. It's about teamwork, so I'd like to really acknowledge the support of my team members. The Leadership Award for Partnership in Philanthropy recognizes current and former faculty members' superior achievement in fundraising. This year's recipient of the award is Jonathan York. In 2010, John co-founded Cal Poly Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship after a 30-year career as a CEO, entrepreneur, and venture capitalist. As we started to form the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and realized that we had to begin to build a base of supporters, we talked to some of our alumni who had entrepreneurial track records, essentially, and the, the comment was almost unanimous, I want to help. And as we dug deeper, it, we realized that, yes, we want their money, but the help that they were offering by just being around, by meeting and talking to students, by coaching, etc., was equally as valuable. And it becomes sort of a virtuous cycle where the more they help, the more they support us. And that's a really great thing for a center like ours. I want to congratulate and thank John for going above and beyond the call of duty for our students and this university. John inspires his colleagues by his example and sets the highest standard of what a faculty member committed to advancement, partnerships, and interdisciplinary collaboration can accomplish. His notable efforts, and most of all, his passion, deserve recognition from the university he has helped change for the better. Thank you, John.
As you've seen today in all of these videos, we have many reasons to celebrate our faculty and staff for their dedication and their hard work. Our annual faculty and staff awards are one way for us to show uh, or to tangibly acknowledge all of this fantastic activity that's going on in and around our campus. These are colleagues who engage and inspire and go above and beyond the call of duty, as I just said in that video, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and, and while it uh, is a very few number that we are going to, a very small number we're going to celebrate today, we know that for every one of them, there's another 10 of you out there. So thank you. So we're now going to proceed with the presentation of the awards and assisting us today is Joey. Where did he go? There he is. He's one of our uh, outstanding student poly reps. As I call your name, would you please make your way to the stage to receive your award? We'll start with a Distinguished Scholarship Award. The award reads, in recognition of your service, contributions to knowledge and student experience, mentoring and commitment to learn by doing. Our Distinguished Scholars for the 2014 and 15 academic year are Dr. Wyatt Brown, Professor of Horticulture and Crop Science with the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences. Wyatt is unfortunately not here with us today because in fact he's off being a distinguished scholar somewhere. He is actually at a research uh, conference in, at UC Davis. It's the third international conference on fresh cut produce. You thought your job was interesting, right? <laughs> okay. We do have with us today Dr. Philip Costanzo, Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry in the College of Science and Mathematics. And Dr. Lars Tomanek, Professor of Biological Sciences in the College of Science and Mathematics. Lars. Our Distinguished Teaching Award reads, in recognition of your excellence in teaching, contributions to student engagement and achievement, innovative instructive instruction, and commitment to student success. Our winners this year are Dr. Todd Grundmeier, Professor of Mathematics in the College of Science and Mathematics. Dr. Sandra Stenard, Associate Professor of Architecture in the College of Architecture and Environmental Design. <laughs> Dr. Dustin Stegner, Professor of English in the College of Liberal Arts. Our Outstanding Staff Award reads, in recognition of your outstanding dedication, commitment, expertise, contributions, and teamwork. And our winners are Don Popham, Project and Events Manager, Manager with Facility Services. Maria Arvizo Rodriguez, Academic Advisor with Student Academic Services. <laughs> Donetta Rosan, Administrative Support Coordinator with Agricultural Education and Communication. The Outstanding Faculty Advisor Award reads, in recognition of your contribution to student success through academic advising, mentoring, and career guidance to help students build real world skills. Our recipient is Dr. Kristen Cardinal, Associate Professor of Biomedical and General Engineering in the College of Engineering.
And it's just, you just heard in the uh, videos a moment ago, this year is the first year that we're also presenting an award for faculty and staff who've made outstanding contributions to this university through their focused efforts in developing learn by doing opportunities for our students. And uh, as Kevin Taylor said in the video, uh, to win this award at this university is a pretty amazing thing because we have so many people doing so many great uh, activities around Learn By Doing. That award, by the way, was open to all members of this campus and the community who join us in that work. Our first recipient is Dr. Stefan Poiker, Professor of Ma Mechanical Engineering in the College of Engineering, who is being recognized for his project, Design Your Process to Become a World-Class Engineering Student. And Dr. Kevin Taylor, Professor of Kinesiology in the College of Science and Mathematics for his study, Learning Through the Lens of Service. And finally, we're pleased to present the Provost Leadership Award for Partnership in Philanthropy to Dr. Jonathan York, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Faculty Director for the Cal Poly Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Colleagues and friends, please join me one more time in recognizing these outstanding members of our faculty and staff. concludes our fall conference program for this year. Let's go and enjoy the reception. And all of you here on stage, please stay so we can take your picture. It's a good farmer's market out there. Go have fun. <laughs> <laughs>